Not that anybody's asked, but New Year's Day on the Gregorian calendar is a cosmically arbitrary event carrying no astronomical significance at all. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts in England and the Netherlands. Matthew Russell and Julio Acquire. Oh yeah, baby, Baby. Neil deGrasse Tyson. No relation to Mike Tyson. I don't think anyway. Hey, Matt. Oh, oh, happy Happy New New Year. Year. Yes. How was your uh, How was your festive break, Julio? I was great. I, you know, we we have uh, to have a limit on the number of guests, but we have some new good friends over. There was some some drinking involved, as usual, but then a nice and speedy recovery. How about you? Uh, yeah, I, do you know what? I I think this is the first Christmas I've not drunk anything. How about that? I was teetotal this Christmas. Lockdown has made me go teetotal. How about oh, that? You're such a healthy Well, I, I, I wish I was healthy. If it wasn't for that, I really would be just gross. But we did meet up, didn't we? We've got one of the best interviews ever coming up on this episode. You always say that. It's not every day you get to speak to someone that may become the first European to step on the moon. I'm going to go there, but I think... Ooh, those are big words. Yeah, I think Matthias has got a really, really good chance of being that man. Okay, let's go into that. Let's go into that later on when we talk about Matthias launching on the Crew-3 mission of the Dragon spacecraft. I mean, it's not every day you speak to someone that's been training in a Dragon spacecraft. I think that's incredible. No, that that is unique. That is unique. A little bit before 2021, let's go back to... 1895. 1895 on January 4th. Yep. The birth of Leroy Grumman. Leroy Grumman. Who's that, Matt? He was an American aeronautical engineer, but obviously Grumman should give you a clue. He's the person that um, set up, co-founded the Grumman Aircraft Engineering Company. That later became the Grumman Aerospace Corporation that in 1994 merged with Northrop, and they are now Northrop Grumman. Mm -hmm. And that only in 2018, they also absorbed Orbital ATK. So now yeah. they are one of the two big, big primes in the US. And this this is one of the guys that started it all. Yeah. And of course, they're, they're, they're building the James Webb Space Telescope. They're the sort of prime contractor for that. Which is a big uh, launch for 2021. It, it is. I would say that in terms of what's getting launched, that has to be the biggest launch of 2021, possibly of my lifetime. Other than, I suppose I remember Hubble just, but yeah, wow. Oh, we huge. had launches to, of the ISS as well during our lifetime. Yeah, okay. The ISS was in bits though, wasn't it? That was just the. That's more about the space shuttle, but the James Webb Space Telescope. We've been going on about this for ages, and it's the singularly the most expensive thing ever to launch on anything ever. Fifteen billion dollars. <laughs> it's like it's, launching it, the Large Hadron Collider into space. It's, it's a like, big mission. We're launching it on an Ariane 5, by the way, from French Guiana. Yeah, I know. Uh, Insane. It's, it's a very, very important mission. I'm really looking forward to this launch. And uh, as you can imagine, there is, it's, it's very precious. There is a lot of pressure and a lot of attention being paid to, 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 this, to this particular launch. Uh, tell me, Matt, what else happened on January 4th? Uh, on January the 4th, we did have uh, Sputnik 1 in 1958 falling back to Earth. So after it had gone up in 1957, it became, I suppose, the first satellite to deorbit ever. I don't know if it's the first one to deorbit. Because the Americans had weaker rockets, their oh, orbits yeah. might have been lower. Uh, you know, uh, the rocket of the Sputnik 1 was killing a fly with a bazooka. Mm, okay. I don't know, actually, if it's the first one. I, I, I think we, we can ask the audience. That's definitely an audience question. Okay. It's certainly the first satellite to fall <clears> to <throat> Earth, but not, maybe not the first one to fall to Earth. Yeah. Because also, <laughs> what about the upper... <laughs> the, the Sputnik 1 had no, n- no propulsion of its own. So yeah. it means that the upper stage that put it in orbit 
orbits also remained there. Which one they orbited first? So 1959, a year later, Luna 1 reaches the vicinity of the moon. So the Russians were absolutely killing it back then. Well, they at that back then, at that time, they were they were the lead of the of, of the space race. Absolutely, absolutely. But of course, uh, times have changed, and by the time we get to two thousand and four, NASA are landing Spirit rover on Mars, something that no other nation has ever achieved, and that's landing something successfully on the surface of Mars. Very impressive mission. Yeah, Very it's impressive. super impressive. And Spirit's great. Lasted way longer than it was supposed to as well. Just carried on going and going and going and going and going. You know, we just talked about uh, deorbiting just a second ago. Mm-hmm. A news story that made it onto the Patreon feed on the Discord. And it was about wooden satellites. So the Japanese apparently are developing uh, wooden <clears throat> technology for their satellites or at least one company is somewhere, some university. And the BBC covered it as a, uh, it would somehow help with space junk. Yes, I I read that. Of course, the problem with space junk is not that it does not burn in the atmosphere, but the problem is that it does not re-enter in the first place, right? Yeah, exactly. It just stays there, so... If it's too if it's too out of the atmosphere, it never gets dragged back into the atmosphere. So there's an interesting article on Ars Technica about this. Uh, the, the apparently there was not much information in English, but one of the advantages pointed out is that wood could be transparent to some of the frequencies used for the communications of the satellites. So an interesting part is would be then uh, not needing to have an external antenna. Every time you have an external antenna, you add volume, or if you have to deploy it and you have mechanical parts, it's complex. And mm. if you have a failure in the deployment of your antenna, you could have, a, yeah, the end of your mission. So the least movable parts you have on a satellite, the better and the higher chances of success. So if you have the structure made of wood, and it happens to be transparent to some of those frequencies, then you could have your antennas inside the main structure. The weird thing about that BBC article is the fact that it seems to suggest that they were making it of wood so it would burn up on re-entry. But of course, everything burns up on re-entry unless, you know, unless you've got something massive like a like a flywheel or something like that. But or the Mir space station. Well, yeah, you know, something huge yes. and it when it won't burn up. And of course, I, I guess there's pollutants from metals, but th- but that's such a minuscule amount of pollutant in the in the atmosphere that that the wood really doesn't make that much difference. In fact, wood has even been looked at as a as a heat shield to survive re-entry because it ablates. And and that was something that people in the Discord pointed out. So it doesn't really it doesn't really help the the space junk thing. But yeah, it, it's interesting that wood has become a really good modern material. So people are looking into sort of making wood as hard as steel and things like that, and building buildings out of it again. So it's become a, a new material science wood. Do you know who's a material scientist? Exactly. We should have asked Matthias about this. <laughs> But the other the other news story of the week, I thought... <clears throat> Drinks ready? Drinks ready is, is a tweet by Elon Musk. Drink! Someone said oh, they'd done a render of Super Heavy landing on a barge, I think. Is, is this render close? And Elon said, no, what we're actually going to do is catch the Super Heavy using an arm from the launch pad and drag it back down on the launch pad, ready for relaunch in an hour. Apparently, <laughs> what do you think about that, Julio? Well, well, Matt, this is based on two tweets, right? The rest is all the speculation on these two tweets. Obviously, they are looking into this. I think it's a very interesting concept. Um, the catching of the first stage is definitely interesting. Yeah, the point I'm trying to make one. is if, imagine you can launch then once a day and you can launch 300 times in a year. Compared to the number of total launches worldwide today, it's yeah, it's a whole other economy. Yeah, we're talking about a, a new, a new era of space flight, right? It's literally 
kicking the chessboard off the table. Yeah, it's 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 a complete paradigm shift. There are many interesting space concepts, ideas that do not happen today because of the cost of launch. Mm. Solar energy from space. The number of satellites you would have to launch with the number of solar panels and the re- re- uh, replenishment of the solar panels, etc. It needs lots of launches, but it could give you some of the cleanest energy. 2001 style space station. That'd be another one. A spinning space station with gravity. Absolute speculation on two tweets, right? Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> if you're launching, if you can launch once a day, your fixed costs disappear almost. You divide it in between so many launches. And apparently it's using the grid fin, so the grid fins will be over-engineered. And, it, and they're going to get rid. They're going to get rid of the landing legs. Elon Musk is an engineer. First and foremost, he's an engineer. And they might be facing some sort of design issue here. And it's one of the possible solutions. And he just goes and tweets about it. Gets <laughs> everyone excited. Yeah. But we don't know if this will be the final solution that they choose or not. This is a test. Yeah, That's good. Let's test. Let's test a lot of these. Let's watch these tests because they are very exciting. Could very well be not the final solution on, on, on how Starship and Super Heavy will work. Well, let's face it. If we see a Super Heavy booster doing a hop test this year, which could be one of the big things this year, then I guess we'll know a little bit more, won't we? It'd be interesting to because there's no way they're going to start doing this straight away, is there? So it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be interesting in the fact that M- Matt, we'll, just just look at the Starship that he presented back in a few years ago at the International Astronautical Congress and look at Starship now. They are two complete different beasts. Yeah, it's iterative design. One thing is what you see today in the news. A very different thing is what you will see uh, in some uh, in some time at the launch pad. It's a true story. Shall yeah. we go on to less Still speculative? Exciting. Still exciting. Oh, oh it's, it's insanely Super exciting. I think Starship does look like it's going to bring about a paradigm shift, but it may or it may not. We, I'm sure people have sat there thinking things like the space shuttle were going to do a paradigm shift and it didn't quite work out that way. But hey. Every single launcher started with a very optimistic launch cadence. Anyway, we were talking about a super heavy first hop test uh, uh, could happen even in 2021. So what about we talk about the other big things that will happen in 2021? Let's stick to rockets to start with. So uh, ESA have got a big one. You've got, uh, you've got your Vega C. We have Vega C, the maiden flight. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. You you know our little rocket Vega. It launches up to 1.5 tons to to uh, to lower orbit. You see it in the launch pad when it's about to launch. Then you blink and you don't see it again. <laughs> yeah, it's fast because it's that fast. <laughs> it's a new version of Vega that will carry now up to 2.3 tons to lower orbit. This increase in capacity will allow it, for instance, to to launch Space Rider, which is a mission we have talked about in the past. Then you have ULA, who plans to debut the, uh, their Vulcan rocket this year as well. Yep, that's going to be a hu- that's going to be pretty big because it's you know it's the old guard there trying to keep up with the new establishment of SpaceX. Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi are hopefully getting the H three out onto the uh, launch pad as well. That's that's pretty delayed, I think, but that should be interesting. The biggest launch of the year has to be the new Glenn rocket. A, it's going to be enormous, and the landing of the booster is going to look incredible because that that will be by far the largest booster that's ever attempted a, a land. How does it compare to the Super Heavy? It'll be smaller than the Super Heavy. So, yeah, mm-hmm. if Elon Musk manages to get the Super Heavy up before the new Glenn, then that would be that would be something else. It's going to be the battle of the the monstrous landing super boosters um perhaps this year going back to spacex they also plan to the first orbital flight of starship now that would be that would be spectacular more launch attempts by the small rocket companies yeah so that yeah so we'll we'll know a little bit more by the end of the year i reckon about 
how the small rocket market's going to look like <laughs> in five years' time. Who knows? That that's definitely a news. That's that's a very dynamic news story. But I think we would definitely keep an eye on it. I would definitely expect another launch, another launch attempt by by Virgin Orbit at least. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Astra yeah. as well. Yep. Astra yeah. Firefly. There's a yeah. few, isn't there? Then on on my little corner, the there is Ariane six, which right. uh, we we plan to launch it next year in 2022. Yeah, uh, we are going to be working on two very exciting milestones this year, which are the the, the static fire tests. I think you came to to Kuru for the first time for the first lo- first test of the solid boosters, right? Yeah, but uh, although it yeah. didn't happen, it happened a it week didn't after. Happen, I left. It didn't happen yeah. a week after. Yes. Yeah. You should have stayed longer, Matt. I asked you, but yeah. Two two big things we're going to do is the test of the upper stage of Ariane Six. Yeah. In a little town called Lamp- Lampolshausen in 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 Germany, where there is uh, this. Big, big testing facility by the German Aerospace Agency, DLR. And what is really cool about it, Matt, is that we we, we test the whole upper stage of a rocket. We are not just testing the, the engine. We already tested the, the, the engine itself. Now we test the whole upper stage in, in, in this big test bench designed specifically for this. That's crazy, isn't it? Just, just look at old rockets, okay? How many of those failures happen because of upper stage failures? Yeah. Because there were things that you could not test in advance before you use a rocket for the first time. Now you can. And you can test that upper stage and reduce the risks on, on that particular design massively. You know, I love testing. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I, I think it's clear. <laughs> Every time we talk about tests, I go on a tangent. Yeah. Uh, I, I what, love testing rockets. What was the chance of a field trip to La Poltzhausen? I don't see why not. I'll look into that. Yeah, that'd be, definitely. That'd be very, very uh, def- cool. Definitely, yeah, we want cool. to we want to show this in the Kourou front. Yep. Down down in French Guiana, we will be finishing the launch pad. Okay, we will be inaugurating the launch pad and putting uh, Ariane six on it to do a static fire test of the core stage. Whoa. So basically, Oh, okay. You would have the, the 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 boosters attached to the core stage. On top of the core stage, you have the upper stage, the the payload, mm. and fairing, etc. That core stage will strap it on the launch pad, fire it up. Hope it works. Check it out. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's very that's exciting. Good. That is pretty exciting. Uh, also- but this 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 test will not launch the rocket. No. However, there will be some things launching next year. Hopefully. Oh my God! Down in Karoo is the big one, isn't it? The James Webb Space Telescope. I, I I think it's pretty much definitely going to be 2021, isn't it? The planning is there, and uh, it all points out to 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 be in 2021. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, <laughs> massive. <laughs> the caveat: I think we can put an aster- asterisk on any of the topics we're talking today, and and that this is engineering, these big space projects. Delays can happen, unexpected things can happen at any time, and a delay can happen at any time on any of the things we are talking today planned for 2021. Yeah. Okay. However, on, on James Webb, I, I feel particularly confident. Yeah. It is, is. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long way, a lot of buildup, and, and things seem to be on the right track. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that they've gone slowly, slowly, making sure that it's all good. I mean, imagine launching it and it not working. Just doesn't well, it, it did happen to the Hubble, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it happened to the Hubble. Oh my so god! You do not want that. No, you don't want that. Um, um, talking of talking of bad first attempts, we've got um, Boeing's CST one hundred Starliner. That is going to have a second uncrewed test flight that I believe Boeing are paying for as a kind of apology, and that should be soon. That should be in January, and then a crewed test flight in summer. Of 2021 so testing 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 I testing, testing. Testing. you love a bit of testing but here's 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 a good one we've got some moon launches as well 2021 could be all about the moon so we've got the clips program the commercial lunar payload services program astrobotic technology and intuitive machines have both got launches to the moon so that should be interesting. The Russians plan to launch uh, the Luna 25 lander. Yep. So they're starting their Luna Globe Exploration Program. That's quite nice, isn't it? Twen- number yep. 25 after Luna, tw- after Luna 1. 
having its birthday today. Uh, India, Chandrayaan-3. They're going to have another go at landing on the lunar surface, which I think they got so close last time. They'll do it this time. That's going to be super exciting, Chandrayaan-3. Yeah. We have the launch of Artemis 1. Artemis, this has definitely got an asterisk next to it. I, I, I rate this a lesser chance than <laughs> James Webb Space Telescope. But Artemis 1, actually, <laughs> SLS launching could be like one of the best things ever to go watch. It's got to be, it's definitely going to be the loudest launch. That is going to be monstrous. <laughs> Call me an optimist, Matt, but I want all of these things to launch. I want all of these things to launch on time. Uh, I want, to, I understand we are in this difficult industry, but I, 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 I wish the best to each one of these, oh, of, yeah. of these projects. There was, there was a slight problem, wasn't there, in the green test that they did recently for SLS, yes. but, but it yes, wasn't indeed. that, it wasn't that big a deal. So I wonder, hopefully it won't delay them that much, but. That's, I think there was some issue with some valves or something, and they will. The, the delay was only of a few weeks. But that's why you do it. That's yeah, yeah. why oh, yeah. you Obs. test. Obs. Uh, Mars. Let's quickly. Let's quickly. If we go into the to Moon, there of course is the the really exciting thing happening in February, where a whole bunch of spacecraft that were launched last year are going to be arriving in Mars this year in February. Orbital insertion of. Th- of three incredible spacecraft. Yes, Mars 2020. Yeah, Tianwen One, and Hope. Hope, yeah, Hope. United Arab Emirates, like that is massively punching high. Getting to uh, <laughs> getting to Mars. Um, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. Oh man, Perseverance rover. We've got the we've got the second. Is it seven minutes of terror? Is that what it's called? That's what it was called last time, right? But it's exactly the same architecture again, isn't it? Yeah, Perseverance rover, that's going to be absolutely huge. And then the Chinese are going to attempt the same thing on the 23rd of April. And talking about the Chinese, yeah, the Chinese are planning to start the, the construction of their own space station this year. That's, that's huge, the Chiangong Heavenly Palace. Yeah, with a couple of Shenzhou uh, 12 and 13 um crude launches as well potentially mega exciting heavenly palace heavenly palace yeah the Chiangong. it's a cool name isn't it it's a really cool name especially i have been reading some just random yeah. stories and books to my kids and and there was some chinese one and they had to do as well with the some god in its palace in in yeah, in the sky and dragons oh uh, and- uh, yeah they, all, all the all the spacecraft are named really Nice things like the Magpie Bridge and things like that was the name yeah. of those satellites that that relay the data from the far side of the moon. Brilliant. Have you noticed this different styles on the namings by the different uh, organizations? You go to NASA and you talk about freedom, discovery, perseverance, yeah. like oh, yeah. really punchy oh, yeah. things trying to be as inspirational as the American dream. Yeah. And then you go to the Europeans, and everything everything is Copernicus, Galileo, Columbus, uh, Archimedes. I don't know. It's yeah. Arch- Newton. Uh, everything <laughs> yeah. has to yeah. do with uh, homage to some past explorer, past scientist. Yeah. And now you go to the Chinese, and it's all these beautiful, beautiful poetic names in a way. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the new names used by by like uh, Rocket Lab. Yeah, or, rocket lad, don't stop me now, and or or SpaceX because they are actively moving away from the one big word inspirational to something mundane, mundane, mundane or or just quirky. Photo picture of, or it didn't happen. Yeah, pics or it didn't uh-huh. happen, and it didn't, Pixar and it didn't, didn't happen. happen. That's the one that, that failed, isn't it? Well, the okay. uh, <laughs> bad, bad choice. Bad. The uh, I love the informality of that. Of course, I still love you. Is quite a good one as well. That's brilliant yeah, to, yeah. to move into those names because it really it really shows that they don't take themselves so seriously. True. When you pick a big, big name for something, you're just you're just putting yourself on a place that you really have to be there and stay there. But talking about names, look, Cosmic Kiss. Cosmic Kiss, yeah. 
Matia Maurer's mission. I love it. It's very informal as well. I love that that going in that direction. Yeah. Well, More, well, we'll, hear, we'll hear all about it. He's got a very good explanation. Yeah. I, I, uh, and, and, and it brings you closer to the people that if you pick like some big aggrandizing name, right? Yep. Yeah. One launch that you are pretty excited about next yeah, year. Yeah, so um, we, we heard from Bob last week uh, that he was very excited about the Psyche launch. But uh, on this day, on the 4th of January 2017, Psyche mission and another mission called Lucy were both named as the Discovery missions 13 and 14, Lucy being 13. It's going to go and look at Trojans which I think should be really, really interesting that it's going to go to these Trojan Trojans being these these asteroids that trail and go in front of large planets because of the Lagrange points around the, around the sides of them. So it's going to be really exciting that there's that it's, this is going to go to the Ju- Jupiter's uh, Trojans, of, of which and, there's a whole bunch of them. And, and this uh, can give great insight into planetary formation. And what these these Trojans are made of? Yeah, so this, which is why it's called Lucy. So Lucy, it's called Lucy because Lucy is the name of the fossil skeleton of a of a, a homonym that uh, apparently is the mother to us all. We're we're all related to Lucy. So the, all the planets are related to these Trojans, and Lucy got her name from Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds by the Beatles. They were playing that very very loudly in the expedition camp when they found the skeleton of Lucy. And get this, very first target that Lucy flies past is um, in 2025 will be an inner belt asteroid, 52246 Donald Johansson, which is named after the discoverer of Lucy. And he's from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It's a, it's a really exciting mission. So it flies does this inner belt, then flies off again, goes to Jupiter, looks at the Trojan asteroids that are flying in front of Jupiter, ahead of Jupiter, then flies back to Earth to get a gravity assist to go back and do the ones that are trailing behind Jupiter. So it's just an absolute ace mission. <laughs> so, I, I can see why you're so excited about it. Yeah, I, I, It's very, very interesting. And it may even end with a uh, another flyby of uh, some other asteroids as well. We talked about Lucy way back this time four years ago, uh, Jamie and I, when we talked about Lucy and Psyche when they were chosen as the new NASA Discovery missions. But Bob's excited about Psyche, as am I, but I think this Lucy one's going to be amazing. So definitely be there for the launch of that. So that's going to be launching sometime between October and November. Everything. We have so many launches between October and November. <laughs> yeah. In other words, they'll all get pushed back to it's, 2022. <laughs> it's going to be insane, October to November. Before we go into our main interview, mm-hmm. uh, there are two two other pieces, uh, two other news pieces that, I, that, that we found happening in 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, first one, apparently the Russians are planning to offer again uh, launches for tourists. Interesting. Yep. Interesting well, of course, indeed. well, they've got spare seats now. Yeah. They? The last mission done like this was 12 years ago in 2009 with Guy La Liberté. Yep. Owner of Cirque du, Cirque du Soleil. Wow. Probably they have some available seats um, via a, a company called Space Adventures. They plan to, fi- to fly passengers to the space station in, in 21. Whoa. And then... Then, one that you pointed out, the the orbiting of the Pierce module of the International Space Station. Yeah, that's... You have some history with that, right? Yeah, so yeah, when I, when I was in Cologne, I was chatting to Antonio Fortunato, your friend, and a mm-hmm. super awesome dude. And he was pointing... And a huge space history. Oh, man, he's he knows everything. Nerd, yeah. And he was, yes. he was pointing to this big, massive International Space Station model that's hanging in the Cologne... In the European National Centre. At, at, at the EAC. And he yes. pointed to the fact that Piers isn't there and there's a little model of Nike with the European robotic arm. And he goes, do you know what that is? I said, no, no idea. And he said, yeah, Piers was supposed to come off ages ago and be replaced by Norca. And Norca comes with the European robotic arm. So ESA built this robotic arm for the Neuker, um module that's massively delayed 
And so both have been in a crate for absolutely ages and uh, look like they're going up this year. So if they do, we should definitely get Antonio to come back on and, and chat about it because that'd be awesome. Yeah. We should always bring Antonio back. No, we should bring him back anyway because he was... Yeah, the guy could yeah. probably have his own podcast on space history. Maybe we should have him on every week. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> MS-15 looks like it will be there to deorbit the Piers module. Yeah. That, I think, will happen. Whether we see the launch of Norca to replace it or not, that, that will be interesting as well, whether yeah. that happens. Okay. So if it happens, we will count on Antonio to tell us a little bit more about this story. Big time. Sh- Big time. Shall we get to Matthias? Matthias Maurer. Is it an astronaut of the week? Astronaut of the month? He's the astronaut of a lifetime. <laughs> astronaut of the week. Well, let's have him as astronaut of the week. Astronaut of the yeah. week. He was chosen really recently to be the seat of uh, on, on a Crew 3, on a Dragon mission to the International Space Station. Indeed. Only last month, in December, it was announced... Uh, that he would be flying in this mission, and and we were we are so lucky that we can open the the first episode of 2021. Yeah, with with a bona fide celebrity astronaut. I mean, it it doesn't get cooler, does it? Than the astronauts that are flying up on Dragon. Yeah, and well, he uh, he goes into that and and into flying on a dragon or flying on Soyuz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was born in 1970. Yeah, so he's a year older than me. Uh, in in Saarland, in Germany, his background is mostly in material science and materials technology. Yeah. Okay? The guy is a world explorer mm-hmm. of the likes we had before in this podcast. Uh, he's a polymath. Yeah. He he he's a traveler. He's a photographer. He's into cycling, hiking. And he also happens to be really good at foreign languages. Do you remember last week that I told last week or in the last episode I was, I think a couple of weeks ago, that I told you that he had become my favorite astronaut? When I'm with you anyway. He speaks German, English, clearly. Yeah. Spanish, French. He's now learning lots of Russian and Chinese. Yeah. But one of the things that happens is that when you know the, the more languages you know, the easier and faster it gets to learn other extra languages as you you're familiar with that concept Matt? I am well I I had a friend who was fluent in 20 languages and and he described fluency by the way as if you spoke to him you would not be able to tell he wasn't uh native to that country so he could speak 20 languages <laughs> freakishly good at languages and he said 20 was the maximum that you could ever have going at any one time he said it's 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 really weird that there, there seems to be this capacity that the brain can only keep twenty of those languages going at any one time. <laughs> but over over, barely, his, over his uh, life, he'd spoke thirty or forty languages. I can barely keep three fluently, <laughs> fluently as well. And oh, uh, fluently, I can barely keep Spanish. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even speak fluent English. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I it, it, as uh, as you know, I'm English, so therefore I can't really speak any other languages properly at all a little bit of french a little bit of french julio that's a um, petit peu uh, you your <laughs> i i heard your countdown your, oh, ex, your yes. french is flawless <laughs> my french countdown that was brilliant like, well, yeah. i don't understand why everyone was laughing at me while i was doing it it was just i was dead serious you're gonna get chucked out <laughs> going back to uh, going back to matthias so yeah he actually joined the isa astronauts only in 2015. He's the, the last one to join this group. He was part of the first selection. Uh, he goes in a lot of detail on that, but he joined uh, in officially as an astronaut in 2015. And uh, he won. he will fly for the first time this year. Yeah, actually, that, that, All about it. that bit of his story, I think, is really, really fascinating. And actually, it's heartbreaking, actually, as, uh, particularly if you listen right to the end. I think feel, I'm so chuffed for him that he's got a space flight because this guy really deserves it. Being up and down, but he's stuck with it. I mean, talk about staying on the bus and perseverance. Yeah, Genuinely a, a, an amazing story. Shall we go listen to him? No, Matt, let's not listen shall, to shall it. We not? Shall, we, shall we just delete? <laughs> I'm going to just delete it. <laughs> Flush it down the toilet. Everyone just... It was a really great interview. You'll just have to have it in your mind. 
mind how good it was. Because <laughs> trust us. <laughs> just, just trust Julio and trust me, it was a great interview. Um, oh, go okay. on then, shall, it? Let's, shall we? Shall we play it for real? No, no, let's, let's, let's do it. Okay. Let's play it. A Kute. You're listening to the Interplanetary Podcast, putting the ace back into space. We're joined on the podcast by Matthias Mara from ESA. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, hello. And I'm also joined by Julio as yes. well. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, Matthias. Good to see you guys. Very excitingly, Matthias, you've recently been assigned a flight which is incredibly exciting for everyone in Europe and fans of ESA. And I suspect even more exciting for Germans as well. But before we get on to that, we really wanted to talk about your sort of early life, how you got to where you are now. So can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and your sort of journey to becoming an engineer stroke scientist, material scientist, before you even got to ESA? Yeah. So, um, well, I was born in Germany. And as a kid, I could see on television how... Uh, Ulf Meerbold, the very first Western German, um, flew to space in a space shuttle. I was absolutely fascinated by it. But um, I always say that this wasn't the moment when my dream to become an astronaut started. It was actually too big, too far away from me. And I, I never imagined as a kid that I could actually be one of those who have the privilege to fly into space. So my childhood is in the southwestern region of Germany, close to the French border, close to Luxembourg as well. Uh, I grew up and uh, watched all those um, fighter planes, um, like in dogfights above, above, well, in the air above our house, um, because our house is very close to Rammstein, well, close in terms of uh, flying a plane. Um, so I always wanted to become a pilot. And um, later on, when I went to university, I thought like, okay, pilot, maybe you can only do in the military, but I opted to become um, like, um, to not go to the military, but to do a civil service. So I was during the compulsory military service time, I was an ambulance driver. And um, that was actually during the time when the German wall came down. And um, so that, when I was um, um, allowed to leave earlier my military service, or like the civil service in this case, and um, to go to university. And I wanted to study um, aerospace engineering, but because the wall came down, the universities all were already fully packed and you couldn't sign up anymore for this topic. So I decided to go for material science engineering. And um, that's what I found out is really what I liked. And so I studied material science engineering, also in different European countries. And um, in 2008, when then uh, ESA was looking for new astronauts, and I heard this on the news in the evening when I came back from work, I saw like, hang on, it's like, uh, that's, that's something that I was always fascinated by. And uh, what is actually the, the job of an astronaut? And um, so I thought like, astronauts are scientists, they do research in space, they work with technology, which is like the best technology available worldwide. Um, and riding a rocket definitely requires uh, the best technology. You work in international teams, and I love working in international teams. That's also what I did during my studies. And then the, the adventure part of becoming an astronaut. So that's sort of like, okay, this combination only is exists in the job of an astronaut. And within five minutes, my decision was taken. Uh, I want to become an astronaut. So for me, definitely, it was the dream of an adult. And Matthias, before we go into the whole astronaut selection um, and, and your time at ESA, uh, during your studies, I, I'm, I, I remember you telling me a story that uh, you did some studies in Argentina and Matt read somewhere that you did some studies as well at Leeds University or you did something at Leeds University. So for those listeners from Argentina and from Leeds, I was wondering if you can go a little bit in, uh, tell us a little bit of what you did in each place. So I started studying in Germany and um, I very quickly found out, okay, as an engineer, you, you should be able to speak a decent uh, level of English. Um, actually, I figured out during travel in Ireland that my English wasn't uh, that good. So I decided, okay, um, why shouldn't I go to the UK to study one year abroad and to uh, learn material science while at the same time also learning the language? Um, that's what I did. And uh, I spent one year studying material science at the University of Leeds. And in Leeds, 
I really enjoyed like getting what well, the language and the, the, the subject matter of my studies done at the same time. And that was such a rich experience. And I learned at the same time, okay, my home university is now building a new partnership, an international degree. So I signed up immediately after the year in Leeds to enter this international branch. And that allowed me to go for one and a half years to France to study there and later on half a year to Spain. But in order to go to Spain, I needed to uh, prove that I have some Spanish language skills. And um, so um, it was compulsory to do an international training ship in a Spanish speaking country. And it happened that one of my classmates um, was actually married to a professor in uh, Argentina. So, and she helped me to organize this internship and that's why I ended up in Neuquén and in Córdoba and um, so I spent there learning a little bit about material science again but also um, learning Spanish and about the Argentinian culture. And you have a really really good Argentine Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> well it's like I have to admit uh, it's like the professor was a little bit uh, too ambitious he brought me in argentina to a radio show and saying like look i brought a student from germany and uh, his spanish is so good and uh, it wasn't it wasn't at all at that time and uh, so this radio show was uh, uh, quite a challenge oh, but I, I i do remember when we right. met the first time in kuru uh, and you started talking in my language with a very good Argentine accent and I was really surprised in a really good way. I still remember it to this day. Uh, by the way, you mentioned your application to the Astronaut Corps back in 2008, but then you joined the Astronaut Corps per se on in 2015. So one of the questions Matt and I wanted to ask you was, what did you do at ESA during that time? How did you end up doing other jobs before that? The, the astronaut selection started 2008 and it was during one year that we performed lots of tests and exactly one year later, 2009, it was decided, okay, uh, these are the new astronauts that ESA will train. And um, well, it's like I passed all the tests and we were 10 at the end of the selection that passed all the tests and that could be um, become astronauts at ESA. But then the director general of ESA said to the 10 of us, um, I have good and bad news. Um, the bad news is I only have six tickets to space because at that moment, the ISS program was only financed till 2015. That means like one flight per year. So six flights. And he said like, I only can hire six of you guys. And Matthias, you will unfortunately not become astronaut. So that was a massive disappointment, you know, when you pass one year of, of selection, lots of tests, and they actually tell you, you have everything that we ask uh, you to become an astronaut, and we could hire you immediately as an astronaut. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a ticket for you. So that was um, a big moment of deception. And uh, well, I was really, really disappointed, because I always I almost felt before that moment that like, okay, I made it, I'm in there. Um, but then the director said like, look, it's you four, um, the four that we will not hire for astronaut, it's like you performed so well, we, we would like to hire you for ESA nonetheless. And uh, you will never, and he used the word never, you will never become astronaut, but you still can become director general because he himself at that moment, uh, the director general, was somebody who passed all exams to become astronaut in a former selection, uh, but he never flew to space. So he exactly, he knew what he was talking about. So I, I liked his attitude. And uh, I mean, after one year um, being busy with all the space topics, I really wanted to change my job and, and start at ESA. So I said, yes, of course, uh, I want to start at ESA. And uh, I was offered a job in Cologne at the Astronaut Center. My other three fellow um, colleagues who applied and who were not selected, they decided, no, either astronaut or nothing. And they continued their career outside of ESA. And in 2014, the director general, the same person who told me you will never become astronaut, he actually came again to me and said, like, hang on, Matthias, um, we just are about to extend the ISS program. And I happen to have more flights to the International Space Station. And 
I actually could hire one more astronaut. Are you still interested? And uh, well, what a question. <laughs> of course, I said yes. And um, since my three fellow colleagues didn't work at ESA at that time, uh, I had so much um, like advantage over them so that it was very easy for me to pass all the, the new tests again and to convince in the, in the interviews. And so I was offered the job. Because you were already working on, as, what was it, astronaut operations? European? Yes, um, I worked for... Well, I started at the European Astronaut Center in the beginning as crew support. Well, that is the personnel who helps the astronauts in <coughs> with all the logistics and uh, everything around the organization of a space flight. And I also worked as a Eurocom. And Eurocom is the voice of Europe in the uh, flight control team. So we have a flight control team in Munich. It's the Columbus Control Center. And they talk with the astronauts on the International Space Station. And they help the astronauts to run all the procedures and if there are questions, they, they always have an advice. So I was the speaker, like the CAPCOM, that's the official title at NASA, for the European um, Mission Control Center. So I had lots of training. Uh, the theoretical part of the astronaut training I almost covered completely. And I had um, operational experience. So I knew exactly um, what astronauts will do in space. I knew all about ESA, about the experiments, and so on. It was a massive advantage. Yeah, at, actually, funnily enough, we've, we've already spoken to a, a Eurocom, Antonio Fortunato, uh, for episode 80 when we uh, visited uh, again with Julio to Cologne. He told me a funny story about how he even took phone calls on his mobile phone from the ISS while he was at the dentist. Did you Do you have any kind of funny experiences like that as part <laughs> of your Eurocom experience? <laughs> well, I also received um, some phone calls from space, but never at the dentist. So. <laughs> and I think I, I missed several ones because I always cycled back from work and uh, so I have my phone in, in, the, in the bag. And um, when I arrived back home after the one hour ride, it's... Um, I quite often saw like, okay, you missed a phone call from Texas uh, and you need to know that the International Space Station, it, the phone call comes down via radio to the US and then it uh, ends up as a standard phone call from Texas. So I'm never sure like if I missed a lot of spam phone calls, <laughs> commercial <laughs> phone calls where somebody wants to sell something or if it, I really missed a lot of phone calls from the ISS. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's but I actually funny. had some I talked with Alex uh, several times he called me from the International Space Station my German colleague Alexander Gerst yeah. so Matthias awesome. when, when uh, you're told by the director general at that time um, that you could become an astronaut still a long journey from that day to today when you get assigned uh, for a mission uh, during this long journey, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the process, the training? What was your favorite part of this training over these years? Yeah, between uh, being assigned to become a new member of the astronaut corps and actually flying to space, it's a, it's a long way. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, it's not for everyone. It's that long as for me. I well, I applied in 2008 and I will fly in 2021 at the end of the year. So it's almost 13 years that I waited. Um, well, it's as soon as you're hired to become an astronaut, you have the basic training. And the basic training, you learn all about the basics. You, you learn how a rocket works, how a space station works, all about ESA. The second phase is then what we call the pre-assignment phase. So it's the training that comes before you actually are assigned to a proper flight. And here you learn all the details. You learn how to fix the space station um, if there's anything going off nominal um, or the emergency stuff you learn if there's a fire on board if you have a leak on board or if you have a toxic atmosphere on board so you need to be able to fix um, all this to be an efficient crew member within the team and you also need to know the basics about all the experiments that will come up later on and in the third phase that's the phase where you are where I am now, like in the assigned mission training. I again refresh all the mandatory stuff, like the emergency drill that comes over and over again. But I also learn about the experiments and I learn also how to work outside of the station, uh, like to perform a spacewalk. That is what we need in case something fails on the outside. 
or a maintenance on the outside or if we need to install new experiments on the outside. One really interesting thing that I saw that you'd done in back in 2017, you'd actually gone off with um, another ESA astronaut, Samantha Christopher Letty, uh, to do uh, training in China. What was that like? How, how, how did you, um, presumably there's a, yet another language that you've, you've had to add to your incredible bow of languages. <laughs> yeah, so 2017, Samantha and I were actually the very first foreigners who went to China to train together with taikonauts, the Chinese astronauts. And um, I believe that's so far like the only international training that the Chinese have offered. Um, and that was quite unique. So to give a little bit of background to this, ESA always um, is a kind of like a very flexible um, space agency and we are very like suited to build partnerships that happened already in the past when ESA flew or the national agencies of, of uh, ESA flew already with the Russians before the ISS partnership was established and ESA helped to bridge this partnership um, between NASA and the Russians. And so the idea is that in the future, ESA will also help to bridge the, the partnership or to establish a partnership between China and maybe the ISS partners. Because once we fly to the moon or beyond the moon, we need all players in of our planet to act together because spaceflight is hard and it gets even harder the further away you fly from our planet. Um, and so our idea is to bring the Chinese in and to start working with them in the um, satellite business or in the uh, well, yeah, unmanned um, space operations. ESA had already operated and worked together with the Chinese. And so we built a little bit on that experience and um, started working with them, I believe, in 2013, 14. Uh, we went for the first time to China and started talking about how we could cooperate. So the Chinese were telling us all about their new space station that they are about to build and to fly in low Earth orbit. And they invited us over for a training. And that was the sea survival training. Um, you need to know that when you fly with a capsule to space, there might be a problem during launch and the launch needs to be aborted and you end up in the sea or on the way back from the station uh, in case that you miss the target um, and you can land in a different area, uh, you might also end up in the, in the sea. So that's why astronauts need to learn how to survive whenever the capsule lands on, on the water. And that's what we did. A very, very interesting training. Uh, yeah, how, how long did that last for? Oh. That training itself was two weeks and it was not done in Beijing. The astronaut center in China is in Beijing, but they have an outstation um, on the coast, like one and a half hours by plane away from the, the astronaut center. And that was purely for the sea survival training. We were there um, with, I believe, seven taikonauts, two European astronauts, and a whole team of trainers and medical support team. And we had uh, theory training. Then we also had the training in practical parts, chopped up in small elements. So first we got familiar, uh, familiarized with all the technical equipment, the emergency equipment, like how to shoot the flares and um, how to be rescued by a helicopter, um, how to inflate the, the, the life rafts, um, and also how to use all the emergency equipment on the life raft. And then on the very last day, we had the, the all-out training. So it's like we were placed inside a capsule off the coast of China. And then uh, they created some waves with boats driving around that we really felt like being into rough sea. We had to climb out of the boat, um, no, of the capsule, sorry, in and into the boat. And then we had to survive there for several hours before being rescued by a helicopter. That was option one. And the option two, we also tested a big rescue ship came and fished us out of, of the water with kind of a basket. So these were the two methods that we tested. Was it difficult in terms of the language barrier or was, or, or were they speaking English or? Well, it, it, obviously, <laughs> an international training always has the language barrier. It even happens uh, in the US when when everything is in English. Sometimes I need to ask, like, mm, did I really understand all? Or going to Russia, there we have interpreters. Um, and I also learned Russian. But in China, um, it was kind of a challenge 
but then it was also um, focused on sea survival. So it's with all the pictures and we got also some video clips shown before of what we have to do. You understand much quicker. And I had language training for several years. So it's everything was explained in Chinese. But we also had an interpreter in case of small doubts. And I remember a funny moment. It's uh, on the very last day um, when we were on the boat already and about to uh, like people said like, okay, now you need to jump into the water um, <clears throat> and then the helicopter comes and rescues you. So I was on the edge of the boat and ready to jump into the water when suddenly my Chinese colleague said like, Matthias, wait, wait, wait. And I was like, oh, okay, what's going on there? And they started discussing in Chinese and you need to know it's like it is the very last day. I had already like 12 days of training behind me and they discussed and discussed and I, I couldn't really follow what they were discussing about. And then suddenly they turn around and ask me, Matthias, can you swim? <laughs> so I thought like, well, that's hilarious. I mean, it's like <clears throat> after 12 days of, of uh, yeah, sea survival training, they just wanted to make really sure that I'm not going to jump out of the boat and, and like sink like a stone. <laughs> so yes, I am able to swim. And um, so, and I, then we continued, but it was a, a funny moment and that shows you that yeah, okay, communication, language barrier, it very often is a barrier, but uh, there are means to get around it. And um, so we always were able to fix the problem. It also shows how important even the most basic questions need to be asked and need to be sure. Definitely, definitely. Yes. It's like if, if, I mean, it's they did it fully correctly. I mean, they, the rescue guys on the boat, the rescue divers, they obviously never had asked me before this question. And so they needed to know if I'm able to, if I know to swim. And um, in China, a lot of people cannot swim. So it's uh, here in Europe, uh, it's very common. And I mean, you would think like it's absolutely basic skill of an astronaut and it is being able to swim. But maybe in China, okay, it's like they didn't know me. I was a guy from a foreign country. And maybe they thought like, okay, the, the rules of the Chinese astronaut corps may not apply for European astronauts. So better check, better check if that guy is able to swim. <laughs> better safe than sorry. Yeah, that, that that's incredible. Yeah. So yeah, so we should move on to your um to, to your assignment then. So you you have an assignment uh for Crew Three, NASA's NASA SpaceX Crew Three on a Dragon spacecraft you'll be the second european astronaut to do so uh so when you were assigned that flight how did it feel do, do, do you allow yourself to get excited or is there again this kind of feeling that you've got to be a bit more reserved and and let your training kick in or do you genuinely get excited about something like this <laughs> well obviously there is excitement and uh, but you see like the road to fly to space, it's such a long road. And, and every time you take a little step and people think like, oh, you must be so excited, you're getting closer. But being excited like for 12 years, I was like, <laughs> I don't have that much adrenaline in my body. So uh, obviously I am excited, but I also am concerned a little bit or skeptical. It's, um, you know, there is still a huge risk. A lot can happen. And I've seen colleagues of mine being assigned and being pulled out again because there were medical issues or planning issues. And uh, so um, I only will be fully excited and believe that I will fly to space once I'm fully strapped in, in my capsule and the engine is lit and there's no way back <laughs> to stop this engine. <laughs> That's the moment when I really believe I'm going to space. And um, yes, so at the beginning of the year in May, I was told, okay, you're assigned as back up for Thomas Pesquet. So, and you know, if you're familiar with how we do spaceflight, as soon as you're assigned as backup, you already know that you will be prime very soon, within half a year usually. Um, and, and so that's, I knew it already uh, several months in advance and um, the assignment that came now um, was for me only a logical step. So yes, I was excited, but not as much as people might think I was. So being assigned backup is a sort of stowaway way to start your training. Yes, in the past we had the single flow to launch. That's how we called it. Uh, we flew on a Soyuz with the Russians. And it means 
uh, once you're signed back up for a person, you know that half a year later you will fly in the next Soyuz. And um, that, that was kind of a standard. And it also helps you to be efficient, efficiently trained as a backup. Because, I mean, Thomas will now fly March, April, maybe May time frame. And if something happens with Thomas, he needs to be replaced. And uh, so you need to have somebody being fully trained, being ready to jump in. Um, I'm half a year behind. And that half a year means um, I only would miss the experiments of my flight. But the, all the, the foundation that you need to know, like the emergency drill and how to fix the space, uh, space station equipment, that is part of my current training. So I easily could replace Thomas. And, um, but you don't want to take me out then. You don't want to like train me fully and then uh, later on, half a year later, uh, put somebody else in. So it's also, it creates efficiency and um, it's best use of resources to train first as a backup and then half a year later, you're prime. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned Soyuz and, and it's something that I, 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 in my head, I think that, that uh, astronauts would be pretty chuffed to be sh- flying on the shiny new Dragon. But is there a little bit of you that um, kind of is uh, going to miss flying on something historically that amazing as the Soyuz? And is there actually a chance that you might fly on a Soyuz on a on a future mission? Uh, yes and no. So it's yes, I definitely would have loved to fly on the Soyuz because I mean it's like all of my colleagues have flown on a, on a Soyuz and it's so much space heritage in there. And it's not only the capsule and the technology and like all the basic stuff that you learn because it's it's a very mechanical um, device and so you need to learn way more than you compare to the Dragon, which has a lot of computers and the computer actually does everything a computer proposes to you um, how to proceed in the procedure and you just say like, okay, I accept or I decline. But uh, in the Soyuz, you need to know way more details. And um, so, yes, I would have loved to fly on the Soyuz. Also because I think the cultural part behind is so important. You know, we have an international uh, partnership with the Russians and in the past, half the training was in the US, half the training was in Russia. And a little bit of training also in Europe, in Japan, and in Canada. But um, now everything shifts over to the US, and so we lose a quite important part of the cultural um, part of the exchange um, with our Russian partners. And I think the international partnership needs this exchange. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of sad that I will not have the same experience as my colleagues. On the other hand, um, I'm really looking forward to flying on the on the Dragon. It's a very modern, a very shiny capsule, um, and the training is very um, well, way more efficient, I should say, because you need to uh, learn so much less. The computer and the systems take over a lot of the responsibility from the astronauts compared to the the Soyuz capsule. So um, it's um, yes and a no that um, I would have loved to fly on the Soyuz. But in the future, uh, all the European astronauts will fly on the commercial U.S. vehicles. That's either the Dragon or the Boeing. And I don't see any chance for me to fly in the near future on a Soyuz rocket. But, I mean, spaceflight is very... Um, uh, like that. The circumstances change very quickly, and I should never say never. And who knows? <laughs> maybe given your training, someday you fly with the Chinese, and their version is heavily based on a Soyuz. Yeah, the Chinese capsule, the Chenzhou capsule, is very similar to the Soyuz capsule. It is based on the on the Russian technology. It is, however, a bit more spacious. It is bigger. And uh, coming back to the sea survival training before. The same sea survival training you also do on the, for the Soyuz, but the Soyuz, being narrower, it doesn't allow to bring life rafts uh, for the sea survival. The Chinese have life rafts, and so uh, um, you see you have more equipment because the capsule is bigger. Right, oh, better chance to survive also. So, Matthias, um, the name of your mission, Cosmic Kiss. And also the mission patch that apparently a lot of work has gone behind the the thinking, the selection of this name uh, and the patch design. Can you tell us a little bit about it? The name of my mission is Cosmic Kiss. And uh, 
basically it's I want to bring in more emotions. I want to bring people along with me. I want to take people up to the space station and share my emotions. A lot of people dream of flying to space, but unfortunately that dream might not be able to be realized for, for most of us. And so I always, when I talk to people, I always get the same questions. People want to know like, how do you feel when you fly to space? What's the first thing that you want to do? Are you excited? How do you run your daily life? How do you wash? How do you eat? How do you sleep? And then, so it's like, I really get the feeling that people want to know all the basic, just to, to create their own picture of how they would feel when they fly to space. And they want to know like, are they up to these emotions? Are they, could they fly to space um, emotionally? And, and that is the part that I want to share with all the people on the ground. Obviously, I also will talk about the science and the technology, but uh, most people um, <clears throat> have less um, af uh, affinity to all the science that we do because the science is very complex. It's a, it's a top-notch science that we do on the International Space Station. And so I realize that talking about the emotional part of a space flight is maybe uh, more appealing to most people. And um, cosmic kiss, these are two words which everyone understands, but then the combination, it's kind of, hang on, what does he, what does he mean? So it kind of, it sticks to your head and it starts a, a process to think about it, to reflect. And, and that was the, the initial idea that we, we want to make something interesting, something appealing, something emotional. Um, and the patch that we created that covers this cosmic kiss theme was inspired by the sky disk of Nebra. It's a very old, or actually the oldest uh, illustration of the night sky ever done by humans. And um, the archaeologists still, archaeologists still discuss or debate the age of this sky disk. And it seems that it's around 4,000 years old. And um, it's a disc that shows the night sky. It shows, shows the Pleiades, it shows the moon, and it also shows the position of the sun. And it actually contains a calendar function. And um, so it has a rich value and uh, it clearly indicates the inspiration that the night sky and the universe had on the people like that lived 4,000 years ago. And, and I'm pretty sure like the people at that time, 4,000 years ago, they had exactly the same questions that we have today when we watch the night sky. We wonder like, it's like, how does the universe work? I mean, how was it created? And um, how was the, our solar system created? How did life arrive on the earth, on our planet? And is there life somewhere else in the universe? And all these fundamental questions, it, they've never been answered during the last 4,000 years. And, and that inspiration, it exists always. And so when I talk about space, I want to bring forward like the fascination of space, the emotions of space, obviously also the technology and the benefit. And the slide is, as a calendar function, it had already technological progress and, and knowledge in there. And um, so I want to combine these two themes and and um, well, that is that will be the red line of my mission. Does it tie in with any of the experiments that you're going to be doing on the International Space Station? Yes, it, it does. It, it absolutely ties in with this, uh, some experiments. And well, I need to explain a little bit more about my patch. It, it, my patch shows um, our home planet. And the home planet in a backlit way, so a way that you only can see when you look at the, our planet from space. Um, and it's, it illustrates the unique point of view that astronauts have when flying around our planet. So it's like observing our Earth, sharing the emotions that we have from space. Then my patch shows the moon. And um, between the Earth and the moon, we have in red the International Space Station in the form of a, of a heart, in the shape of a heart. And it shows the human presence in that area between Earth and the moon. And the next step will be the moon. So we are preparing the return to the moon, but not only the return, but also like to advance. And in my patch, we also have a very small red dot and that illustrates Mars. And the ISS 
Moon and Mars are the three big uh, cornerstones of human and robotic exploration in ESA. And uh, in my mission, we will look at uh, the human body, how it performs in, in zero gravity, and a lot changes in the human body. And uh, that's also illustrated by the, heart, uh, the heartbeat symbol in my patch. So we focus on the human and on the medical aspect. And we, for example, look in how the vision changes. We found out that the vision of an astronaut deteriorates after uh, during the time in space. And in the future, when we fly to Mars, we want to make sure that the first astronauts arrive healthy on Mars and that they actually see Mars and can describe Mars. We don't want to run the risk that uh, you send a healthy astronaut to Mars, and but he arrives there blind. But that actually is a risk with the current changes in the human body. We also have the immune system of the human body that changes. It, it um, slows down, so the immune system is less, uh, less active, less responsive in space. While on the other hand, all the microbes mutate much faster due to the space radiation. So it gets more dangerous, but our defense system of the human body gets less uh, prepared. So that's also another problem that we have. And uh, there are many more other problems, like we have bone loss, we have uh, muscle loss. So nutrition is an important part. How can you take healthy food along to stay healthy for a long, long travel to Mars? Uh, <clears throat> While on the other hand, um, making sure that you cannot only take food, we also need to take experiments. So uh, uh, the capsule only has a limited volume and a limited uh, upload capacity. We will also look flying to the moon, um, making best use of space resources. On the moon, we want to produce oxygen from the, the lunar dust. We want to create um, drinking water or fine drinking water um, uh, on the polar regions of the moon. And, and drinking water or water by itself is also rocket fuel. It's hydrogen and oxygen. So um, you see that making best use of resources and being efficient with the resources that we have available, it's a huge topic for extended uh, periods of flying. And so one of the improvements that we do on the International Space Station is to uh, recycle even more and more of all the resources that we have. That will be the air, obviously, but also the water and all the coffees that we drink uh, is uh, the, the coffee of yesterday. So we recycle our urine. And uh, in the future, we will, or in the very near future, we will have up to 92% of recycling rate of the water on the International Space Station. We also recycle materials. So we have experiments running up there uh, 3D printing of objects, currently only with plastics, but also experiments that printed objects, we can, um, we can uh, crack down again, uh, like crash it and make new powder of it and print this new powder again into another object. And so uh, maybe one spare part today breaks down, you fix it, you print it. And then on another day, uh, you see like, okay, um, another device fails. And instead of bringing huge amount of spare parts with you, you just need to bring a certain amount of um, yeah, 3D print material. And then you just print in space all your spare parts. And this would be a good example for Earth and the piling up of resources and, and just the consuming uh, culture that we live in these days and not recycling enough. This is very good. Matthias, you uh, mentioned the immune system. And this brings me to another question that uh, we have to acknowledge the, the world we're living in now uh, with uh, COVID-19. And I read that just a few days ago, on December 21st, the first few cases of COVID were registered in Antarctica. And this was one, one of the... Antarctica is many times compared to the space station in terms of remoteness. Uh, I was wondering, uh, regarding the protocols you guys have in place to make sure that this does not happen in the space station, and also if there is any protocol in case of a positive test in the space station or in case a COVID case is detected in the once in the space station? 
Yes, so we absolutely want to make sure that we don't send um, sick astronauts to the International Space Station. That's a protocol that has been in place um, since the Apollo days. You remember that in during Apollo 13, one of the astronauts, he needed to be replaced by his backup because there was the, the, the risk that the, the astronaut got infected from his kids. Ever since, we have a protocol to isolate our astronauts before the flight. Usually it's two to three weeks. Now with Corona, we even went up to four weeks of isolation. We go into quarantine and we make sure that uh, the astronauts are healthy inside and only healthy people can um, like enter this facility where the astronauts live and stay. And um, we have a lot of um, medical support around it. We test all the people that have contact with the crew just to make sure that we send healthy astronauts to space. And you're fully right. Um, corona on the space station is something that we absolutely need to avoid. Maybe it's a mild um, disease that could happen and then there wouldn't be any major issue. But what happens if an astronaut in space gets really sick and he needs to go on a ventilator. We don't have a ventilator on board. So uh, that, you see already, that situation we absolutely need to avoid. And that's why we trust 100% that the quarantine, the four weeks of quarantine before the flight, need to cover everything and uh, we only send healthy astronauts to space. In the next few months, um, hopefully we also get the chance to get vaccinated. And uh, as soon as astronauts are vaccinated, I think the risk um, is significantly reduced. And then maybe we can return to a three-week quarantine instead of the four-week quarantine. If someone does get very sick on the ISS, what is the protocol at that point? Not necessarily COVID-related, yes. but if that, you know, if you, you know, a virus that they've maybe picked up as a child that suddenly... Or, or even appendicitis. Yeah. Well, I mean, we um, all get medical training. We are prepared for emergencies, and um, which means like we can do a resuscitation, we can have uh, give heart massage, and um, <clears throat> also like the standard stuff. If you have an infected tooth, we uh, are trained to pull a tooth, or if you lose uh, like a filling of your tooth, uh, we are trained to uh, put in a replacement. Not as nice as a as a as a medical doctor. But uh, it'll do the job and you can continue to work and live on this International Space Station. Um, in case there's an infection, we have a small pharmacy on board, so you get antibiotics. Um, we have telemedicine, so we are always connected with the ground. And uh, we have ultrasound device, so the doctors on the ground can guide us to run a procedure and to check um, if there's something internally wrong with the organs. Um, we send these ultrasound pictures in real time down to the ground and the specialists uh, analyze it. We have means to uh, take blood samples, that's a standard procedure, uh, also to analyze certain blood values on board of the station. But um, everything more complicated, and you mentioned before uh, appendicitis, um, we are not equipped to run a surgery in space to remove appendicitis. And, uh, but the, um, the medical community is quite confident that with all the tests that they run before a flight and all the uh, medication that we have on board, that they can control all major issues. And um, if we need to return to the ground, we can go into our Soyuz capsule or into the Dragon capsule, and then within like a few hours, you're back on the ground and you have rescue teams on the ground that can come and help you. And then they bring you into a medical facility and then you're fully safe. That is the current status for the ISS. But now we're looking forward to flying to the moon. And we are about to set up a new station which flies around the moon. It's called the Gateway. And the gateway is um, not flying in a low orbit around the moon. It's flying in an elliptical orbit. And so you cannot always leave that gateway station and return to the Earth with, within a few hours. Um, that's just like the way um, the orbital mechanics works. So, and once we land on the moon, you also cannot immediately leave the moon and fly back to the Earth. So you see already, 
exploration, the next step going towards the moon, it requires an improvement in all our medical setup. And that is currently the work of uh, working groups in the medical community to see in how much more training the astronauts need to get, uh, how much more equipment we need to bring along in order to be resilient also for more severe medical emergency cases. I'm not sure if we will be able to resolve the appendicitis or if um, maybe astronauts, before you send them to Mars, need to have the appendix removed before the flight. Is, that was something done to astronauts in the past, right? Well, in the past, they did several stuff. I'm not sure if they removed the appendicitis, but um, there were cases when you had um, like the fingernails or the toenails when they were infected that they pulled the nails uh, proactively. Um, so <laughs> it sounds almost like torture in the medieval ages. Yeah. But that was done in the past, in the early days. Yeah. When you're talking about missions to the, to the moon and Mars, I could imagine that it's a, there is a lot to learn from Antarctic bases where you are actually isolated for six months with no ways to go back as well. You mentioned that you are going to go, you have done some EVA training, I understand, and you're going to do some EVA certification. Uh, is every astronaut trained to do EVA uh, or is this something that only the astronauts that are planning to do EV, operational EVAs are doing? Are you planning to do some EVAs during your mission? In the past, when we had the space shuttle, we always had um, special astronauts being trained for EVA, means spacewalk. Um, nowadays, that we fly to the International Space Station, um, we need to make sure that there are at least two persons trained and qualified to, uh, to perform a spacewalk. Because if something breaks on the outside, um, that's very important that we can fix it in, in a short time. So at least two persons are certified, but now with the Soyuz, we had three on board, um, and with the Dragon, we have four astronauts on board. Um, it happens that usually you have at least three astronauts on board of a Dragon um, certified for doing spacewalk. It, it is not mandatory for all astronauts to be certified. And sometimes it's even challenging. The spacesuit, it's, it's a well, it's a very sophisticated instrument. It's like a small spacecraft, but it's also extremely tough and strenuous on the human body to work six hours in space. It's called a space walk, but um, it is really tough work. Um, and every time I train in the suit and I'm um, six hours in the, in the pool in NASA, below water afterwards, I feel so exhausted and tired, I'm ready for the weekend. And uh, so indeed, some of my colleagues, and especially the ones that are like of shorter stature um, and, and tinier, they have um, well problems with the suit because y you need to have a certain like range with your arms and hands uh, in order to move efficiently outside of the space station. Talking at the gateway and 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 going to the gateway, is there? Presumably, there's there's limited European astronauts that are going to the the gateway. So, uh, are you one of the astronauts that would be eligible for that? And and are are your colleagues thinking about thinking about the the, the going to the gateway and, and possibly going to the moon as well? ESA just signed an agreement with NASA uh, about the cooperation to the gateway. So we provide technical equipment. We provide some modules. Uh, we also provide the um, service module for the Orion capsule in exchange for getting astronaut flights to this gateway station. And indeed, uh, three European astronauts um, will have the chance to fly to gateway, hopefully also one of them uh, to the surface of the moon. And having only seven active European astronauts in, in, in the European Astronaut Corps and all are uh, eligible for a flight to the gateway, um, gives me kind of almost a 50% chance of flying closer to the moon. But there's no guarantee, obviously. The, the one thing that is important and mandatory for us all is to stay healthy. Um, because if you're not healthy enough, your active career as astronaut is over and immediately over. 
Is there any talk about what would happen if, if an astronaut caught corona and, and sort of post-corona, or is if they if they only suffered from mild symptoms, that wouldn't be considered a kind of health strike, as it were? It's a very good question. It's like, what happens if an astronaut gets corona? Um, I think the, the, the medical community is continuously talking about this topic, and uh, the same questions um, are valid for everyone else, like who uh, gets corona. What are the long-term effects and do the long-term effects, even if you have only a mild um, form of corona, uh, would this impede uh, your active astronaut career? I cannot tell you what uh, is the answer on that one. Uh, I just want to remain healthy and stay healthy and <laughs> yeah. uh, just avoid getting into that trap. And you should, and you should. Um, you talk about the three tickets to the gateway. Um, I was wondering what is, uh, obviously the next step is going down to the moon at some point. I was wondering if uh, those three tickets would already be uh, in a position that they could be moonwalkers or this is something that is more far in the future after that. Well, the agreement that ESA signed with NASA is that um, we will, in the next year, set up the gateway station that flies around the moon. And um, only in 28, well, that's the current plan, um, astronauts will fly to the gateway and from there then to the surface of the moon. So that means like everyone who between 2024, when the first astronauts will fly to the gateway, and 28, they will only fly to the gateway, but they will stay there and do remote operations in real time on the surface of the moon of, of moon rovers, but they will not leave the gateway to land on the moon. So um, it's a lot of speculation if one of the three European astronauts will already walk on the surface of the moon. Um, but I'm pretty sure that after the first phase, well, the current contract goes or the current agreement goes to 28, that once this agreement is extended and then the next phase uh, will definitely include more moonwalkers. Well, yeah, I think it's really probably exciting. obvious, an obvious answer, but would you be interested in walking on the moon? Oh, definitely I would be interested. I mean, um, I already trained quite a bit for moon operations, moon surface operations. We have in European Astronaut Center, several training elements that focus on the future. It's the uh, uh, Pangea training. You, you maybe have heard about it or talked about in, in it. In fact, uh, a week ago, we interviewed Loredana Besone. And, oh, okay. and we went so, deep on that. So to know that you're one of the participants, we wanted to ask you if there was time on your, your experience and how it went there. So this is great. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm kind of the, the guinea pig astronaut for the Pangea training. So they developed this training. That training brings us um, into contact with all the, the most important lunar geological formations. So you look at the moon and you see there are dark areas and there are light areas. And the, the dark areas, it's the volcanic regions of the moon. It's the lowlands. It's where Apollo 11 landed. And then you have the, the bright areas, which are the highlands of the moon. And in the highlands, you have different rock formations. And in order to train this um, on our planet, on planet Earth, you need to go to different areas. So the lowlands, the volcanic areas, we train in Lanzarote, and it really feels like walking on the moon. And then for the highlands, it's more difficult, more challenging to find because you need a, a kind of geological formation, which is called anortosite. And um, that is only available in, um, in special areas of our planet. In Europe, uh, we had to go all the way up to Norway on a small island um, and to practice there how we would walk on the moon, uh, identify all the geological features that are of interest to the scientists and how to pick and choose um, the right samples, rock samples, and how to take them, how to bring them back to Earth for analysis. Um, then there are areas on the moon, which you also can identify with a good uh, binocular. It's the craters, the impact craters, and that we train in Germany, in the Ries crater area. Um, well, it's between Bavaria, Bavaria and um, uh, Schwabia. And um, so that's also an impressive part. And the rock formations there are different again 
to the other areas of the moon. I was blown away by Loredana. I thought I, it seems such a such an exciting thing, the caves and and Pangaea stuff. But it, the the way I understood it was, yeah, they they were essentially teaching. It, it seemed like it was um, pilots and things like that that ha- how to become geologists. But yes, uh, it is. you're a, mater- a material science person. It was 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 it hard to become a geologist? Uh, add that string to your bow. Um, it was kind of interesting because. Um, like challenging in certain aspects, but uh, very easy in other aspects because material science and geology, actually the training when you go to university, it has a lot of uh, areas that are we both have in common. So um, I know how to look into uh, a microscope and how to talk about um, the crystallography, the, the, the microstructure of a material. And it doesn't matter if it's a rock or if it's a metal um, the, the, well, the approach, the scientific approach is the same. But then walking outside in the area, walking in Lanzarote, and then seeing like, okay, there is everything around you is rock, volcanic rock. So and which rock do you actually pick and bring back home? Which is the good rock? And which is the, the rocks where people would say, hmm, nice choice, Matthias, but we would have chosen a different <laughs> one. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, you need to learn quite a bit. You need to talk the language of the geologists. Um, I mean, we talked in English, but uh, when you describe the area around you, the landscape, it's a, it's a complete different language. Um, and you need to understand what they want from you. And uh, they are your eyes and ears. And um, well, actually, I'm their eyes and ears, and I need to describe it. And I'm also their hands to pick up the right rocks, but they need to train me so that I'm the best um, technician on the ground to do actually the job for them. So it was challenging because uh, some of the features, you know, cracks in rocks or dislocations or landslides, and where do you look at? And uh, so that is part of the training. Um, and how do the how do you discover the most prominent or the important features of the landscape? As you talk, I mean, you, your experience as a, as a human being from right from university right the way through ESA training and all these different experiences, it's such an, an amazing life, isn't it, really? Because you've, 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 you've just had this opportunity to learn and learn and learn different things and, and, and fill your brain full of amazing stuff. So what, 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 was, the, what was the single best piece of advice that you had when you were young, that's kind of set you on this path of, 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 of this really great life. Is there, is there anything else that you, is there something that you could pass on to, to people listening to this who, who go, crikey, I, I, I'd, I'd really like to live that kind of life as well. Yeah, it's very easy. Never stop dreaming, never stop learning. It's, uh, and, and be ambitious. Um, if you don't have a big dream, you will never be able to fulfill it, yourself a big dream. And uh, I never want to stop learning because there's so much to learn and um, as soon as you get background information on the different stuff, you see the world with different eyes and you appreciate and you see the bigger context between the different uh, geology and, and and how people live in on, on the island of Lanzarote. So it's all interconnected. It's we humans adapted into the environment that have, that we have around us and and transferring this, looking towards the moon, it's like I can picture myself of the stone age that we will enter on the moon once we are there it's like it's a stone age on one side combined with high technology on the other side and uh, so in order to create the vision and to shape the future you need to be able to understand the past and and all the the big picture on our planet and uh, that's the most fascinating aspect um throughout my entire training. We have two sort of standard questions we ask uh, every guest. First one is, if you could bring back someone from the past, a hero, and anyone, to see the work that you do or just to show them how amazing the world is today, who would you bring? Well, I very clearly would, would bring one of my closest friends that I lost um, during the selection, during the astronaut selection, a very, very close friend um, that he was such a sporty guy. He trained me. He said, like, I'll make you fit to become an astronaut. 
Um, and then I entered the phase of medical tests to become closer to my dream. And he suddenly realized, uh, oh, he has a medical issue. And um, he discovered that he had brain cancer. And um, two weeks after the director general told me, you will never become astronaut, he actually passed away. And um, that was, um, let me say, like a really big loss for me, like a, a friend, a really dear, dear friend, which helped me to get closer to my dream. And um, yeah. Yeah. It'd be a beautiful moment to be able to bring them back to see look what they did for you, I suppose. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. We've got a space related playlist uh, on Spotify for our for our podcast. Is there any music that you listen to that's space related anything that's uh, that means something special to you or may even make it on your playlist for your ISS visit? Well, it's like I think I will take all the play all the, the space <laughs> songs with me. Um and actually music is a very very important topic also um f- for me. Uh, I love music and I think I said it in the beginning of our talk. Uh, I want to share the emotions that I have in space. And music is a universal language. It's, um, I mean, you listen to music and, and immediately your emotions are influenced by, by the type of music that you hear or amplified. And um, so we want to play music from space and make a massive event like having a, a electronic music. Um, together with um, well, famous DJs on the ground and just link space to the ground. It's, uh, we've seen a bit of that during the mission of Luca Parmitano, but uh, we want to make something similar, but bigger and even more innovative. So uh, stay tuned for that. Is it going to be uh, like your yeah, hardcore German electronica? <laughs> I'm not a hardcore <laughs> German electronic music, but I love, I love techno music, yes. But not only techno music, it's... Um, I also like rock music, independent music, and all this stuff. Yeah, I love music. Thanks very much for it's been a, yeah, it's been really brilliant. I'm I'm very jealous of the of uh, of people when I when I hear astronauts and just how what what an amazing what amazing life you've got. It's it's absolutely fab. Yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. the the sort of training you guys uh, do seem even more exciting than the actual space flight. I have to say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's you're working towards the big dream to fly into space. It's the, the climax of uh, of all yeah. the work that you put into it. Obviously, the training, it's all unique, but you train for a purpose. And um, it's like you train to drive a car and you train during years and years. And then you also want to drive that car, no? <laughs> you finally <Yeah. laughs> want to be there and say, like, I drive that car because I've worked so hard. And so that is like also for me, it's, I enjoy every single minute of the training, but uh, definitely I also want to fly to space. You know, if you, if you, I, there is one question I skipped, but since you mentioned this, I wanted, I, um, basically your colleagues like Tim and Toma and Alex, they, they ever, after their missions, they have, they have become national heroes, personalities, super famous and they're in each country, obviously super influential as well. I was wondering how are you preparing for this fame that will hit you more and more after after your flight or during your mission? Yeah, I don't strive to become famous. I think Tim in the UK he has a unique position because he was the first uh, Brit to fly to space on a, on a like as a, an official ESA astronaut, so that's unique. I will only be number twelve in Germany, so it's a uh, it's. People know it already all and have seen it all. And um, Alex, Alexander Gerst, uh, was the first German to fly to space and use social media. And he had two very successful missions. So he's very famous and big. But it's not my ambition. It's like I want to share my emotions. And um, I don't want to create an image of uh, me being a superhuman, uh, which I'm absolutely not. I think everyone could fly to space. Um, and in the future, space flight will become like more and more normal. Just look 100 years back when people saw the very first planes in the sky and thought like only a, a superhero can pilot a plane and fly. Now, uh, even in a wheelchair, you can like be uh, on board of a plane and fly uh, around our planet. So it becomes more and more standard, more and more normal. And um, that's also what happens now with the, the Dragon capsule. It's uh, 
much easier to fly because the machine does more for you. So um, as an astronaut, I I am definitely a standard normal person. I'm highly trained, yes, but uh, everything will become more and more easy, more accessible. We will also see probably the first spaceflight participant when I'm up there on the space station, the first uh, commercial spaceflight participant on the US side. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's I'm just a privileged person, but I'm definitely just a normal person. So when, when you come back from the International Space Station after after your six month stay, what 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 job? Presumably, you still have to go back to work pretty much straight away. What what, <laughs> yes. what, what what's what jobs do you what jobs do you do you end up having to do? Is it is it the same jobs that you did before going, or do or do you take on some extra responsibilities once you're post space, as it were? Yeah, once you come back from space, usually you need at least four years to fully recover. And before being eligible again to fly again to space. So, and, and I hope to fly again to space after my first mission, uh, like towards the gateway station or towards the moon. Um, and in the meantime, um, well, after the flight, you do a little bit of PR, you do a, a lot of sports um, to get rehabilitation done and to become again in a good shape. Uh, and then I will do project work. And the, the project work, that I did in the past, uh, I will also continue in the future, is preparing the European Astronaut Center um, for moon exploration. We are about to set up a new training facility, which is called Luna. And this training facility is fully focused on moon exploration. So in that facility, we will train procedures on how to explore on the ground. And it's fully linked also with the Pangea training uh, of Lodadana Pesone that we just talked about before. Uh, we want to have a lot of external scientists come to ESA and to practice their experiments in this lunar facility together with astronauts and to uh, advance quickly and to mature all the equipment um, for this very rough environment. It's a dusty, harsh environment on the moon. And uh, in Lanzarote, we figured out that a lot of the experiments already fail due to these harsh conditions. And so we will um, set up this training facility. We will learn how to train future astronauts for moon exploration. We will develop equipment together with external providers and scientists. And uh, I'm really looking forward to continuing this project. Matt, this yeah. sounds like we will have to go to Cologne again to visit this center. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see the facilities. Yeah. Okay, Matthias, thank you. Thank you so much for your generous time today. Uh, this was an epic interview. Um, <laughs> we look forward to your mission and we hopefully talk to you again after your mission to you tell us how it went. Excellent. Um, so again, thank you so much, Matt. Do you want to? Close well, yeah, it? no, yeah, same, same here. I, I, there was a, an image quite recently of Victor Glover as he as he got off uh, as he went through the hatch into the ISS, and and I don't think I've ever, ever seen anyone look so happy. <laughs> so I kind of I kind of get the feeling that you, that you'll have a similar sort of face as you definitely as you poke definitely. through. So <laughs> I can't I can't wait for that. I'm definitely going to be glued to my TV. Yeah. Very good. Very good. good so ideas. good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Thanks very much for your time. Thank yeah, you. I thank you. The Interplanetary Podcast is alive. So Matt, what, what, what do you think of this interview? It's almost impossible to think that I was sitting there chatting to an astronaut. He, he was so down to earth, so instantly just a really nice person to talk to and, and can't believe he's a year older than me. He looks about 30. <laughs> <laughs> he's just insanely uh, youthful and 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 he's done so much as well. I, th well, Matt, I'm sure if you shave, you will also <laughs> look that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the grey hair gives it away, Julio. Whatever I <laughs> no, do, no. But I mean, we are talking now on a podcast, uh, and and this is yeah. all the only. So trust us, he's a very young, young-looking guy. Eh? What a great way to start 2000. And 21. It's a hard act to follow. It is. It right? is going to be bl yeah. blooming hard. Tell me, Matt, uh, this interview, mm -hmm. 
what 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 do you think? What was interesting about it? I always think this at the end of interviewing astronauts is that as a job, obviously we only ever talk about the bit where they go into space, and often we only talk about the bit of them going on the launch and being excited that they're in a dragon. And I was even guilty of it myself. But really what they do is this huge job before they go launching, before they do anything like that. And and the fact that Matthias has been learning all these different skills like learning how to be on the moon, learning how to be a geologist, learning how to do the plumbing on the space station, basically learning every single life skill you could possibly have. Even learning some medicine. Learning medicine, learning how to pull teeth. I mean, it's just like, hang on a second. It's basically he's done everyone's profession and taught it to astronaut level. And you think, that it's, what an incredible job to have. And I'm so jealous. You know, anyone who's a lifelong learner, to be an a astronaut is is like the holy grail. That That's what it seems to me. And it's just like, I'm so glad that he stuck with it. I'm so glad that he's got his chance to kind of go to space. Because he's clearly just this one of this one of these people who just loves what he does and is dedicated to it and he's not, you know, no e it's not ego driven. It's not like he wants exactly. to be a rock star he's, or a pop star. He's so humble. He's so humble. I, I have to say he, sometimes he gives me a bit of a Neil Armstrong kind of vibe. You know, yeah. like the, the guy that just wants to do wants to do his job. He's excited about it, but he does not he's not searching for the spotlight. Yeah. I wonder, okay. yeah, I wonder if he'll become a uh, university professor and the lecture halls will be fill, fill, <laughs> filled because it's like, yeah, are you going to that? Uh, are you going to the material science lecture today? Yeah, who's taking it? Ah, oh, it's Matthias. Yeah, I think I'll go. <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Yeah. I know, I'm on a wild speculation here, but he could be one of the European moonwalkers. He's one of the only foreign astronauts, one of two. To have to have gone to China to 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 train with them, he's done the Pangaea mission and and, Nemo. and done Nemo. He's done caves, anything. And like you said, the others will have done their second space flight by the time that he gets. By the time that these moon missions start coming up, he'll he won't have. He's the last to have done the space flight. So he's got a massive shot of being the first European first European astronaut to step foot on the moon. You know, and that will make this episode absolute glory. <laughs> I mean, obviously I'm rooting for him. I'm, well, I'm rooting um, yeah, for him. I mean, if it's Tim Peak, yeah, that's great, but if it's <clears throat> but, but if it's Matthias, that's great too. See, but does it matter who goes first? No, I think just to be on the moon is, you know, let's face it. Just just to be one of the moonwalkers. It's, it's, I... it's done now. Armstrong's first. That's it. It's done. It's a bit like Yuri Gagarin. You've done the first. But no, no, I have a huge conflict. I have a huge conflict with that because I know. Neil Armstrong was the first one to step out of the spacecraft. Yeah. But there were two guys running the same risks together. Yeah, uh, yeah, ab Okay, absolutely. Neil and Buzz. And, and it, we're always with the who was first, who was second. It does not matter. They were both uh, on the same boat, literally. Yeah, they, they were. And Buzz Aldrin is world famous as a result. But Neil Armstrong was was chosen to be the first man on the moon. That's a marketing stunt. Not just that a marketing is... stunt. It's because actually he was a better person to be the first person on the moon. But I cannot disagree more with you. They are both incredible humans. It really should not matter who happened to open the door and go down the ladder. It should not matter because if they had run out of fuel and they had crashed, they would have both died together. I know, but... If, if, if they would have not uh, been able to, to relaunch from the moon, they, they were one unique team. And this whole thing that we, uh, we keep... Even how many decades later, who was first? Who cares who was first? Yeah, no, absolutely. If, you know, it should we, not it, matter. It shouldn't matter, but it but it does. <laughs> it should not it matter. It shouldn't matter, but it does. I, I, but this is the worst thing. I I, I, I I'm just re I'm just realistic in the fact that people will talk about Neil Armstrong forever. People will talk about Yuri Gagarin forever because they were the first and it's like who was i wonder who was the first person ever to set foot on another world well it was neil armstrong it wasn't buzz aldrin 
So the, the I, I I know it's hard. I don't think we will ever agree on this <laughs> like, because I also <laughs> consider them both equally famous. Doesn't matter that Neil stepped down first and the other. Equal recognition for Buzz and Neil. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I I I agree. I agree. Look, I agree. And in the future, in the future, it does not it does not matter which European steps on the moon first, as long as we have Europeans also stepping on the moon, and who cares in what order. Uh, anyway, Julio, if people have liked our rant at the end of this particular episode, they should go to interplanetary.org.uk. If, if you want to go even deeper and you want to join the Spodcats on Discord or or just help out, and it's deeply appreciated, by the way, is at uh, www.patreon.com forward slash interplanetary, or actually just make sure you write a review on iTunes or or make sure that you're subscribed somewhere to the podcast and that will be absolutely awesome. Uh, a lot of work goes into this and uh, we're happy to do it because it's, it's talking about space in 2021, the year of space. <laughs> That's it. Julio, what are you doing this weekend? As every weekend, social distancing, wearing masks, training rugby, running. Well, how are you doing with the whole confinement? Uh, yeah, it's pretty dull. It's pretty dull. I, I, 2020 was, was great for the podcast and there was some, you know, we had some ACE interviews last year, so mustn't grumble, get through lockdown, get my vaccine and start to rebuild the world. I really missed Space Rocks. Mm. I really liked that event and I really miss the ISA, uh, ISA open day. Yeah. That, yeah. You, you came to one yep, of those. Yeah. S tech. Yeah. It's so rewarding because many for a long time you're working on your job, internal things. And this is the moment when you, when you get to come out and talk to the public and talk to the kids and explain what you do and see their, their, their eyes open up. You know, it's that every, every job, every job you do, no matter what, I'm sure that even someone like Matthias at some point might find some monotony in their job, mm. right? But it's that moment when you when you when you face the people, when you talk to kids, it's really motivating to see how special things are for 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 these kids, for the public, for the people. And well, in part, this is a lot of this is what I get out of being in this podcast now. So I actually have to thank you. It was uh, being part of this has been super motivating and i and i thank you for uh, yeah, yeah for, for letting me part of this well no letting me, I, 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 for letting me be part I, can, of I, can, I keep thinking it's it's far more it's far more i should be grateful to you julio i can't yeah i can't thank you enough <laughs> and on that note man bye bye thank you cats bye bye